Yeah, it's recording. It's on already. Alright, welcome everybody for the uh, second Bitcoin Symposium in Regina. Thanks all for coming. Uh, we're at the uh, Queen City Hub. And uh, I'm just saying that because this will be on YouTube later and people will know where we are, even though you, of course, know where we are already. I'm John Klein. Um, I'm a Bitcoin enthusiast and I helped organize this uh, symposium and the uh, last symposium in March. And uh, I helped uh, collect our speakers here and uh, they'll be sharing lots of interesting uh, economy and the alternative economy sort of information and Bitcoin information and trade bank. Uh, and we even got a demonstration of a, uh, a Bitcoin system right here. Uh, this is uh, John Kozan. And uh, on his right is Dan Banesh and uh, Andrew Rutishniak and Nathan Seconder on the end there. And so we'll get underway with, um, let's start off with uh, Dan and he'll tell us about uh, Trade Bank. He was lucky enough to be on CBC uh, Morning Radio uh, at 6.15 a.m. today. Uh, and so it was before I heard, but I heard the replay, so that's the best way to, to catch that uh, and take it away, Dan. Thanks, John. Um, it's probably best that we start with, with my little talk because it's probably the most furthest thing from the Bitcoin from all the other presentations. They probably have a little bit more to do with actual Bitcoin. Uh, mine is more just in general terms of, uh, of a private economy. So I'll take you through the boring kind of business side of what I do for a bit and then I kind of just wanted to um, touch on a few things about the, the private economy and the, and the, uh, the private currency that we have and, uh, and then open it up to some questions from you guys. So basically, um, I'm the owner of Trade Bank Regina and what that is is a private economy currently with about 140 business members in it that all use the trade dollar, which is our, our currency in the system, as a means of tracking the goods and services that they sell with other members of the network. Um, so the, the trade dollars are essentially created in the, in the economy from the bank. And our, our bank is in our head office in, in Ontario. So they create the trade dollar currency. Um, they issue it out to the, the franchise regions as needed as the system builds up. And then the trade dollars get dispersed organically through the selling of goods and services. I was like this person coming in. Are they coming in? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Just make it awkward for him. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody stop and stare. <laughs> yes. Yes. You found it. You're in the right place. We're, but we're learning about trade dollars right now, which aren't even Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. So um, basically, as, as it stands right now, um, just like in any economy, really, you want to balance the, su the supply of the, um, of the dollar to make sure that there's not too much of it or too little of it. So as it stands right now, our economy has about somewhere between five to 600,000 trade dollars in it spread across 140 members. So our clients are sort of banking up a four to $5,000 trade dollar balance. Now the question that I normally get asked is, which is probably one that's very similar to Bitcoin, is why would people want to do business in your currency? Because you know, cash has been around for a long time, it's very secure, I can pay all my expenses with cash, but I can't with the trade dollars. Um, Certainly, a very, a very valid question that a business owner would have because you know that everyone's still in the cash is king mentality. Um, so my sales pitch when I when I talk to these people is that number one, I know that you have business expenses. I know that you have personal expenses. You are constantly spending your cash. In the cash world, it's very difficult to earn. You have to um, have to have a marketable product or service. You got to get out there and promote it. You have to have good customer service, good warranty. It's really hard sometimes to acquire that cash. Once you have that physical cash in your hand, very easy to spend. You could liquidate it in seconds online. Um, the trade dollar world is actually the opposite. I heard the term today from, from someone that works in the, in the industry, a colleague of mine in Ontario. He called it a reverse economy because in the trade dollar world, more people are buyers than they are sellers. And if you think about it, um, for a period of time, you, you understand why. It's because the trade dollars can be spent in fewer places 
than the cash dollar can. So our clients, and we, we kind of drilled this into them, we have a, a slogan that's called Think Trade First. So before they spend their cash dollars, which can be spent anywhere in the world, we want them to spend their trade dollars first on another local business product or service that they can get with the trade dollars. Um, I'll stop right there first of all. <laughs> Sometimes I ramble, so did, I mean, are we all on the same page here? Does anybody have any questions that might clarify some things before we keep going? No? Sounds okay so far? Okay, so um, obviously there's, um, there's, there's an, an adoption struggle, right? Getting people to understand that this is a legitimate currency that, that businesses use um, and derive actual value from it. So when we started, it was like selling the first fax machine and going to the guy and he's like, wow, this is an awesome idea, this is so cool, who can I fax to? You're the first one. And that was the same way in Regina when we pitched the first business. He said, this is a great idea, uh, you know, this sounds good, you know, I, I, get, I do, do business in a different currency, that's fine, as long as I can get stuff for it in return, so what can I get? It was a lighting shop. And uh, the answer was, well, you're the first one, but trust us, we're going to go out and get a bunch more. So he's like, all right, sure, I'll give it a try. So he signed up, and then that week we had another 30 businesses that joined, uh, that joined on to do business in the same way, and since we've just been growing at four to five members uh, every month since, and now we're at about 140 after almost three years of operation. So that's kind of the boring business side of it. Now some of the things, that I, I, I want to try to bring this back to Bitcoin, I guess, because that's why everybody's here. Um, so there's some comparisons that I, that I see, obviously. It's because um, our currencies are not cash. Uh, they either have to be converted to cash in a certain way. I, it's my understanding that Bitcoin there's ways to do that. Converted, yeah, okay, you guys can educate me on that in the next presentations. Um, with our with our dollars, we get asked that question all the time. Oh, I'm, I'm actually really short on cash this month. Can I take some of my trade dollars out in cash, convert it to Canadian dollars? Well, the short answer is no. There's actually no way to do that. You acquire the trade dollars through the selling of your goods and services, and you liquidate them by getting goods or services back in return. Um, but that being said, there's nothing stopping any of our clients from, say, um, buying a fireplace and then selling the fireplace. Because a fireplace is a marketable item a hot tub or a massage chair or buying something that's that's more liquid uh, and then selling that into a secondary market. So they're going to take a hit, they're not going to get that full value of 100% for their trade dollars. Which I never mentioned, but the, uh, the trade dollar is one for one with the Canadian dollar. So when our businesses sell, uh, they sell at the retail price that they would sell in the cash world and when they spend, they spend at the retail price of the other businesses as well. So it's something that we have to do to keep everything fair and equitable. So our clients always want to get the highest value for their trade dollars, um, ideally a one for one. Because that just sort of, then they feel like they're getting good value over the dollar. Um, probably the main difference, I think, between the trade dollar and, and the Bitcoin is um, the volatility or, or even the perceived volatility of the, of the currency. So I know there was a big, with Mount, with Mount Gox and everything, got in the news and then so a lot of people kind of got scared about it. People that probably didn't really know much about Bitcoin. Uh, the people that knew about it were just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but the, the ones that didn't got really scared. Now with the with the trade dollar, we are set at a value of one for one with the Canadian dollar. It doesn't change, it doesn't fluctuate. It has to stay that way because we are actually, um, barter networks are actually governed by the CRA. So we fall under the same taxation rules as the Canadian dollar. When you take in a thousand dollars, thousand trade dollars, sorry, as a sale, you have to count that as revenue. When you spend a thousand trade dollars on a business expense, you still get that same receipt. You can still write off every penny of it. So that's what we, we tell our clients is that if, you're, if you want to keep this, uh, you know, 100% above board and, and make sure that everything at the end of the year is a wash, whatever you take in, in trade dollars, spend back on business expenses. If you do that, in the, the year, there'll be absolutely no ca tax implications. Um, some business owners like to spend personally on things, and that's totally fine, as long as they claim it as a dividend, or uh, a salary, or a bonus, or something like that, or just write a check back to their company for the same amount. So maybe I'm getting a little high end here, but um, that's basically it. So on, on a day-to-day -day basis, I manage this group of people who all have this currency and want to exchange it for something else. And we get paid basically what we call a brokerage fee, it's 12.95%. So that's how we make money as a business. Every time they spend the dollar, 
we get paid 12.95% in cash. So that's our that's our business revenue model. It's like a it's, it would be like a tax, a levy, a fee, whatever, for our services of exchanging the, the dollar around. Um, most of it doesn't happen automatically. I would I, I would like it to. I wish my clients would just go and exchange $100,000 a day in trade dollars, and I would get paid 13% of that. But unfortunately, it's not that easy. Uh, it's it's a struggle every day to show people the value of the trade dollars and to get them to essentially exchange their cash in terms of their, their time or their product or their service and take the trade dollars on as a non-cash asset on their books to get the future benefit from it. Because that's really what it is. It's exchanging cash now, a lower portion of cash now for a larger gain of something in the future. So that's basically what I do. Uh, and it's what's going on in China. And actually there's, there's about 10 regions across Canada. There's, I, I couldn't even hazard an estimate of how many trade dollars, maybe two million in trade dollars in our, not two million, not 10 million. I don't want to say a million. There's about 2,500 business members across Canada that are all using the trade dollar as a form of currency. And, um, and yeah, the goal is to kind of have 20, 20 franchise regions across Canada and uh, 20,000 members by 2020. So we have a lot of <coughs> A quick question. Do yes. you have any members outside of Virginia? Me personally? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a couple of members in Moose Jaw. Um, there's also a Saskatoon region that's a completely different franchise region. They have 110 members, so we are about 250 total in Saskatchewan. Uh, another question that usually gets brought up is that can general public join? And the the, the short answer is is yes, they can. But the, the long answer is really the only way you can acquire the trade dollars is by providing something of value in return. So you would have to sell something that you own um, or provide your time and, and labor in terms of, you know, maybe you're a drywall finisher or a painter or something like that. So you would provide your, your time and bill it at your regular hourly rate and provide services in that way. Um, or if you were really... Um, Team, you could essentially start your own sort of business where if you found something that you could buy at at a dollar and sell it for ten or trade it for ten, then you, you're essentially acquiring your dollar to a ten to one ratio. But then it, basically you're just starting your own personal business, and you could do the same thing in the cash flow too. Yeah, this uh, reminds me of uh, banks from 100, 200 years ago. Uh, the government allowed them to issue their own currency. The, uh, the weakness was that uh, they would only be accepted within a small local area, mm -hmm. but you've turned that into a feature. Yeah, yeah, that's sometimes people ask that. They say, like, why would I take trade dollars? I can only spend it in, in a few places. And we say, yeah, that, that's also the benefit. When our clients go to look for something, like, they say, oh, my car's a mess. I really want to get it detailed. You look in the phone book, there's going to be maybe 10 places in there that you can go. So all those businesses have a 10% chance shifted slightly for market share and things like that, but about a 10% chance of getting a business. In the trade bank network, we're not going to have all 10 of those businesses on. So the businesses use it as a competitive advantage to help gain a little bit more market share in their industries. So we only have two other retailing places on. So now you have a 50% chance of getting all of the business that comes from the trade bank clients. Yes? Um, my question is about uh, the fluidity of the merchants. If I'm in possession of these dollars, how do I know where I can go spend them? Sure, yeah, all, for all of our clients, we have a list that we update constantly as to which members are accepting the trade dollars. We also have this, this is my, you guys have digital wallets, this is my analog wallet. This has in it about, I would say probably $10,000 worth of gift cards that can be traded for through our system for things like uh, auto detailing, extreme hawking storage as a client, um, yeah, Suds Car Wash for other detail. Uh, I, I could open up and go through Baron Fresh Grill, uh, Dino Bouncers, Lush Beauty Bar, Jeans. Yeah, I just, there's sort of an online place where I could go look at These are the merchants that are accepting right now, and yes. that's the universe in which I can spend. Correct. And the, and the reason why we get paid money for, for providing these services is because most of the time, you're going to actually call your broker. So you basically have a barber broker. You call your broker and say, uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm doing a renovation at my house. I need someone to finish up this drywall here. I'm going to need some blinds. I'm going to need some flooring. I need, uh, I want to buy some paintings for the wall. You tell them all the things that you're about to spend your hard-earned cash on. 
and it's their job to go and find it through trade. And we don't make any money unless we do. So if we spend, get all those things for you on trade, that means you're going to sell more of your product or service in return, and it just keeps the whole system flowing. All right, well, I guess, oh, sorry. I'm curious. You yep. said the only way to get trade dollars is to sell something. Yep. How did the trade, do trade dollars get into the system initially? Yeah, that's, and it's a very good question. Sometimes it's, I do find that's a point of confusion for people. So when, uh, first of all, when we launched the system as a promotion, everybody that joined got $500 as an initial sort of like welcome to the system. That Please use this. Stimulus package, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, myself, too, the, the franchise cost a considerable amount of money, and I also got a, a trade dollar rebate as part of it. So basically, with the, you know, take these dollars, you can only spend them in your region, use it to promote your, use it to, you know, do print printouts for your business, promotions for your business, basically use it to, to help stimulate the economy. Um, and then from there, uh, because Ontario is a more established network, they have a lot more trade dollars there. So as we as we got going, and we had you know a hot tub supplier that wanted to sell a hot tub, but nobody had ten thousand trade dollars, so we would ship a hot tub out to Ontario and import ten thousand trade dollars in. Now, you, again, as I mentioned, I think um, originally they have to come from somewhere, right? So the, the bank, the trade bank head office, basically creates them. They now have a debt on their books for this money that they've created kind of similar to the, the banks issuing their own currency. And so now our local region isn't just local now, it's actually starting to spread Canada-wide. So the, <clears throat> the trade dollars you acquire within Regina can be spent in Ottawa, possibly? Yeah, correct. It happens all the time. We do lots of business back and forth with Saskatoon, the sister city, but we also have bought and sold things in, in Medicine Hat, in Edmonton, um, and taking trips to Ontario. Yeah. But not out of the country. It actually can. It's more difficult. We have a trade bank system in the U.S. And so, uh, for example, our, we did a trip to uh, Cripple Creek in Colorado. Another question. Do, do your uh, trade dollars have any anti-counterfeiting anti features? Anti-counterfeiting features? My, like my printed out trade dollars? Or? Right. Uh, like, again, going back to the uh, they issue. issued because uh, yeah. one of the weaknesses is that because they weren't as well known, uh, it's less likely that people would recognize if it was counterfeit. So. Yeah, so people could easily duplicate it, right? So, so here's an example of ours. I guess I'll show one to the, to the crown too. So our, our graphics designers will create uh, individually number, and then also there's an embossing on it, which is our, which is our anti counterfeiting feature. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, right there. So then we emboss it. Now, I mean, can somebody get the same weight of paper, try to photocopy one of these and, and duplicate it? Yeah, um, but our, our members, our, our vendors track the, the numbers. So if one came in as a, as a duplicate or something, you would obviously know there's a problem, but really it's extremely unlikely and difficult to happen. And, and all the gift cards are in small, small denominations. So. Uh, so does that work out? Like, so at the end of the year, is that, However many trade dollars you actually have remaining is would be the only ones that are taxable? Um, well, I mean, it certainly it depends on your fiscal year, right? Yeah. But yeah, if you start the fiscal year with zero and, uh, you know, whatever happens... You accumulate middle. some trade dollars and then you use them to get services done <clears> instead. So at the end of the year, you're, you're back down to zero. Yeah, mm -hmm. then, there's, then yeah, you won't get taxed on any of that. At the end of the, that's the thing. If you sell 30 grand and it's right before the end of the year, you're going to have to pay income tax on it. Now next year, when you spend that thirty grand, you're going to recoup it. But from a producer standpoint, you could actually probably get pretty close to tax free on some of your selling if you just sell for a service. And then at the end of the year, you make sure your account zeroes out. Mm -hmm. I, if there's no taxation on it, I guess you probably beat the tax on it. Well, it's the same in the cash world. If you sold ten thousand dollars worth of stuff for cash and then spent that ten thousand back in your company, you're you're not paying any, any tax on that too. It's, it's the same way. Uh, it's if you spend it on business, you're it's it's a right off your business anyway. But that still be go down as taxable income. And these trade dollars are really taxable income. They would, but you would just have expenses to offset it. Yeah. Yeah, like if, if you go and spend up ten grand on advertising, which is a right off your company, so it eliminates all that ten thousand revenue that you came in. Go ahead. What about the tax on individual transactions? PSD, GST. PSD, and GST still charged. Still, they, uh, our clients will collect it in the trade dollar currency, remit it to the government in cash. Then when they when they buy something, they will pay the GST and PSD in the trade dollar currency, 
and get to submit that receipt on their taxes to get the input tax credit. So they get it back. The taxes are washed, they're kind of in the same way. Uh, I know, it's kind of hard to wrap your, <laughs> wrap your head around sometimes, but uh, I'll do an actual example. I buy $100 for the printing. The actual bill that comes to me is $110. So I'll give them 110 trade dollars. He'll have to remit $5 to GST, 5 to PST. Now, um, when I sell $100 worth of stock, my bill is 110 and they pay me 110 trade dollars, I now have to pay the government that $5 in GST. So the GST balances out, and then the PST just, uh, you collect it and trade it and submit it. It becomes another cost, I guess. But doesn't that become a problem when you have to pay that out at the end of the year in cash, and that money's now out to trade dollars? Uh, not, like I said, it just becomes another cost. So it, it depends on your profit margin. Right? If you, I mean, no business can really operate on a 10 or 50 percent profit margin. Most have, say, 30 to 60 percent profit. So an extra little five percent in there isn't really hard to handle, especially if you're getting good value from your trade dollars, which I think most of my clients do. Yes. Yeah. What's the advantage of using the system rather than just using the dollars? The bet. Yeah. A very good question, and one I get asked all the time. Um, the benefit is that these sales that are coming to them through the trade bank network are not sales that they would have access to in the cash world because I've got all my clients coming to me with their requests. So I, I land the business with the businesses that are in our system. In the cash world, there's more competitors, more people to pick from. So as I mentioned with say auto detailers, someone opens the phone book or looks online, you have a one out of 10 chance of getting their business. In the trade dollar world, if you're the only person in that industry, you have a 100% chance of getting that business. If there's two, you have 50. So the chances of getting it are much, are much better. As well as there's all, there is also a networking and, and, and friendly sort of aspect to it because we do keep a lot more stuff local. We can actually make it more profitable for a business to buy from another local company that has a slightly higher price than by buying from a big box store. And that's something that makes me feel good at the end of the day. Would you like to see everyone, say everyone in Regina use the trade dollar? Everyone as in every business or? I would like to see, yeah, most. Every person. Uh, that's a really good question. I've never been asked that one before. <laughs> and what, and if I, here's, here, actually, I'll stop you there. There's no benefit to the, for the average person um, for to join Trade Bank because the dollars are one for one, right? So if you can sell your boat for $20,000 cash or 20,000 trade dollars, there's no benefit to you for selling it for 20,000 trade dollars. Business owners have a benefit because their costs are lower. So it may only cost them $3,000 cash to acquire 10,000 trade dollars depending on their profit margin. So that's what it really comes down to, is there's, there's a big benefit for business owners because they can acquire the currency at a large spread, less of a benefit for the average person unless they have a way of doing it as well. Also, like every business in the city was using trade dollars that would actually kill your benefit. Right, it would kill that competitive advantage. It would be efficient to see it. Yeah. Right, and you know what? I say that out of, the, out of all the businesses that could uh, potentially be a fit with trade bank, only maybe half of them are gonna get it. We, there's sort of like a something that we call a natural trader. They just sort of understand that benefit and they, and they like it and they enjoy it and they do well with it. And so we have 140 people now that are pretty much natural traders. Am I running really? Yeah, we're out, we're, we'll, we'll wrap up the questions if there's one more. Or I'll stick around and if you guys have any questions you can ask. There's also a couple of business cards on the back table if you guys want to grab one and shoot me emails later. Thanks for your time. All right, thanks very much, Dan. Okay, next we'll uh, go over to Nathan uh, Seconder, who is going to talk about local and resilient economies. And take it away, Nathan. Yes. Okay, how close are you guys getting this? Is this good? Uh, close. Okay. 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 So, uh, when I said I was going to do this, I thought it'd be really easy. And uh, who would have thought that economics would be complicated? So, <laughs> I, I ended up. Uh, like uh, as uh, Andrew was saying earlier tonight when I was talking about it, this turned out to be a much larger uh, vision than I had expected. So I'm going to do something that's sort of in poor taste and actually read word for word my speech off of my computer. I apologize for not editing, <laughs> but it was just easier. Close then, G. <laughs> it was easier to to uh, just organize it this way. So I'm just going to read, and uh, you know when we're getting looking like I'm starting to use eat up my time, you can wave at me or whatever. Uh, so, here we go. Um, 
So I'm not an expert in finance, economics, or digital security. I don't even understand Bitcoin very well, and I don't pretend to. Uh, basically, I don't know what I'm talking about at all, actually. Um, and I'll probably make an accurate statement, so I hope people will feel free to correct me. So why am I here? I am a philosopher by training. My academic specialization is the theory of systems and meanings. And my career background is in community development projects with a special focus on creativity, justice, and equality. More recently, my work has been devoted to technology and community planning. So my role here is that of the outsider critic. Um, I'm here to articulate philosophical and moral questions that I believe people ought to be asking whenever they're confronted with the shiny promise of a social revolution, which is basically what I think is going on here. Cryptocurrency offers a number of exciting opportunities, but it might also open the door to a pack of problems, some new and some long dormant but ready to reawaken. I'm neither pro nor anti-Bitcoin, but by nature I'm skeptical, and I want to see how it can hold up compared to some of the other new economy models that are currently available to us. So here goes. Um, the market itself, uh, in contradistinction to the previous speaker, this is good to turn into an arm wrestle, uh, the market itself is not a commodity, but rather the medium of commodification. Access to markets must not be governed by free market forces, for the same reason that the freedom of expression does not extend as far as the freedom to remove other people's freedoms, and people must not be allowed to democratically choose the removal of democracy. Freedom doesn't mean the complete absence of all rules and regulation, but rather the absence of bad regulations. There will always be rule systems, because being free means having the freedom to make them, that is, to make rule systems. And sooner or later, someone always will. So when trying to establish freedoms, our goal should not be to eliminate the systems of control, but rather to reform them. It's not all about figuring out ways to get more freedom and power for ourselves. That's just childish and selfish. Sorry, not to suggest that you're being childish and selfish. <laughs> um, uh, that's, I meant that in a different context, but... Uh, <laughs> We also need to ask ourselves what a fair, sustainable, and creative economy would look like. As the saying goes, with great freedom comes great responsibility. So what fiscal obligations do we have to our neighbors, and how can we work with them in a collaborative way, rather than just trying to outcompete them all the time? And this is actually where your, your reference to local economy for them is actually, you know, in support of what I'm saying. Um, market regulation. Right. Market regulation is not just unnecessary friction that gets in the way of our freedom, it's actually a system of checks and balances to guarantee that we act responsibly. If we wish to eliminate it, then we need to replace it with something better. Merely handing the power over to a bunch of Bitcoin miners with no certification, no background in jurisprudence, and no training in formal ethics will not be enough, in my opinion. The goal shouldn't be complete lawlessness, but rather the replacement of dictatorial policing with systems of license certification, consensus-based negotiations, and informed consent. So I went looking for economic models that can balance libertarian market freedoms with socialist moral obligations, and it turns out that there are lots of them. Roman Catholics, for example, have a tradition called distributism, which holds that all people, no matter how poor, have a fundamental human right to own property, to work safely, and to earn good wages. Distributism is a left-wing model insofar as it believes in economic equality and freedom for the poor. But it teaches that the way to achieve this is not by giving a central government the power to control everything, but rather by preventing anyone in government or the private sector from hoarding too much. Market freedom is necessary. It's essential, in fact, in this system. So in that sense, it's a right-wing system. Uh, but it's possible only when ownership over the means of production is decentralized. In other words, small good business is good, Big business is bad. Strong antitrust laws are part of this, but the other part is the right to form cooperatives. It's been my experience that many people nowadays have a very poor understanding of the cooperative system. Co-ops are not charities or nonprofits. They are private sector businesses that earn their own profits through hard work and smart fiscal planning. Where they differ from other private businesses is that they are democratically structured. The participants all have a legally guaranteed equal say in how the corporation is run, so merely hoarding wealth cannot buy you the power to outvote other stakeholders. The latest development in cooperative economics is an idea called collaborative consumption, made famous mostly by a woman named Rachel Botsman, who has made it her mission to spread the movement. You can see she's got a TED talk about it, it's worth watching. 
And uh, her website's actually quite uh, rich with ideas. In a nutshell, um, collaborative consumption is just a traditional consumer co-op model where members pool their money so they can buy an expensive piece of property or equipment and then time share it. But peer-to-peer -peer computer algorithms now make it possible to decentralize the time sharing system across a very large group of people. In some cases, this can eliminate the need for money altogether. A good example of this is neighbor, sorry, neighbor Goods, a website allowing members to post classified ads for goods and services that can be borrowed and returned rather than bought and sold. The borrowing is possible because peer-to-peer -peer systems can track people's reliability score. A borrower who doesn't return the favor will get a low credit rating and lose lender support. In a nutshell, it, allow, it allows for a barter economy with decentralized credit ratings. Closely related to this is the idea of the local exchange trading system, or LETS, L-E-T-S, the best example of which is probably the community exchange system. A LETS economy is not really a currency system, but it's not really a barter system either. Basically, it's an absolute credit system. People provide goods and services in order to earn credit, and they spend this credit to buy goods and services from others. What makes this model unique is that the credit is registered with a centralized public ledger system, basically a universal credit union where the bookkeeping is automated and managed electronically, so there's no need for money ever to exchange hands at all. The ledger is even more centralized than the traditional banking system, but in this case, nobody owns the bank. You might say it's a bit like communism, but without any communists. Another economic model worth looking at is mutualism, which holds that the price to buy something should not be allowed to inflate beyond what it would have cost to make it yourself. I think this is a really important point when we're talking about trading. Um, basically, this is a criticism against usury, as it, was in, as it was defined in the Middle Ages when it was illegal for lenders to charge interest. But the idea also extends to trade itself. Buying and reselling at an inflated price should only be allowed to the extent that the profits pay for the salesman's actual labor and overhead. Merchants should not be pocketing money that they didn't actually earn. It also means that buying and hoarding real estate simply for the purpose of collecting rent is unacceptable. If you're not going to live on it or use it to actually grow or manufacture a product or service, then you should not have the right to hold the title. Once again, cooperatives offer a solution here. If enough people pool their capital, it becomes viable to lend without interest, even for real estate at market prices. This actually lowers the cost of capital acquisition while protecting the lender from loss. Cooperative banking is an old idea, but the internet now makes this possible on a global scale, and there are several good options available. First of all, <clears throat> everyone should be aware of a project called eMoney Pool, which is based on a traditional form of banking called the Savings and Credit Association. In this system, people get together in groups and pool their capital in order to get maximum benefit from economies of scale. In the rotating system, called ROSCA, the Rotating Savings and Credit Association, uh, people usually pay in once every month and register their names on a wait list. At the end of that month, all the money is given to the person currently at the top of the list. No money ever accumulates, it gets paid out as fast as it comes in. There are variations on this model. For example, you can have your name bumped up the list by winning a lottery, or by offering the highest bid in an auction. In this case, the bid counts as a sort of interest that gets reinvested into the ROSCA so that over time the account itself actually grows money rather than uh, the money going to a class of wealthy investors. Basically, if you want to withdraw your money early, you have to pay a penalty, but eventually everybody gets their money back. It's sort of a self-financing debenture. Um, the other alternative is the Accumulating Savings and Credit Association, or ASPRA. As the name implies, in this case, no one gets their money out until the end. This allows for the rapid accumulation of large amounts of capital, which can then be used for collective purchasing or zero-interest microlending. It can also be used for innovation or public works, such as in the Awesome Foundation, where the winning grant recipients must have the awesomest project idea. These are great, they're popping up all over the place. People just get together once a month, they put their money into a hat, and then they make people stand up in front of them and tell them why their idea is more awesome than somebody else's and whoever has the awesomest idea gets the money. Um, since usury is still forbidden by Islamic law, ASPRA-based mortgage systems are very popular and enormously well-funded in Muslim communities. For example, the Ansar Housing Corporation in Toronto works by charging its participants some... Oh, sorry. Skip here. Uh, where was I? 
Uh, the Anson Housing Corporation works by charging its participants a monthly membership fee and then placing them on a wait list. When someone's turn on the list comes up, the member gets a free house bought and paid for by the corporation. Basically, this is sort of a rent-to-own real estate co-op. The company still owns the equity until the member has fully paid for it through membership dues, just as a bank would own a stake in the equity until the mortgage is paid off. The net result is a fiscally responsible but no interest loan. The major drawback to associated savings and credit systems uh, are that they rely on communities that are tightly bound by trust or mutual need, such as families or neighbors, and they tend to break down when large groups of strangers get involved. Uh, eMoneyPool has solved that problem, eMoneyPool.com, I think, it's online, has solved that problem. Users pay a small access fee to cover administrative costs, and by crowdsourcing over a large scale, the company can afford to ensure the risk of non-compliance. Thus, it's no longer necessary to chase down deadbeat members. Your investment is guaranteed by the company. eMoneyPool is more or less a decentralized credit union which allows for self-generated mutual funds. The cooperative economy has been enormously successful. On a global scale, it trades in hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, the most recent number I got was 1.1 trillion, which I think was 2010. Um, but escrow still poses a challenge. How do you move money between strangers without creating security bottlenecks that privilege the banks and brokers? As far as I can tell, the mining system in Bitcoin doesn't eliminate this privilege. It just trans transfers it from the hands of regulated bankers into the hands of unregulated computer geeks. I know that one's going to get darts thrown at me. <laughs> well, you looked at John and he said, I saw that, um, <laughs> A much better system, in my opinion, uh, or possibly better system, we'll see, I think it's open for debate, is the Ripple Payment Protocol, which requires its users to name a social network of people they actually know and trust, and to specify exactly how much they trust them. Using this system, Ripple constructs a chain of debt transfers that connects the degrees of separation between the strangers. Each person in the chain acts as both a debtor and a collection agent, so that debts and payments can be passed without friction across a network of people who actually know and trust each other. This basically eliminates the need for borrowing from strangers, so it's no longer necessary to finance risk by paying interest or handling fees. If you owe money, you will always owe it to a neighbor, not to a transnational bank. As far as I know, Bitcoin is compatible with RipplePay, but I'd like to hear the miners explain why their services are better than Ripple. How are we doing for time? Oh, okay, we've got another five minutes or so. Okay. This leads to the last system I want to talk about, which is a form of left-wing capitalism called Owenism. Although it's usually considered the origin of the cooperative movement, because Owenism started, I don't know, early 1800s, 1840, maybe something like that. Uh, although it's usually considered the origin of the cooperative movement, the original Owenite system was not that different from traditional capitalism, where powerful bosses employ subordinate workers in order to extract a profit. The difference was in how Owenite businesses spent these profits. Instead of simply hoarding the money for themselves or investing it in other companies owned by the rich, the first Owenites actually reinvested the money into improved living conditions for their own employees. This meant, first and foremost, a commitment to social spending in the form of education, health care, and insurance. But in a few cases, the Owenites, including Robert Owens himself, went as far as building actual villages for their staff so that workers could escape the slums and enjoy the comforts of a middle-class suburban lifestyle. As a result, employees were extremely loyal, <clears throat> and Owenite businesses like the Cadbury Chocolate Company reaped enormous rewards from increased productivity. Um, Cadbury was one of the companies that built a town for its, uh, for its staff, and they actually did literacy instruction and all sorts of things. Uh, because the Cadbury family were Quakers and they were morally opposed to um, property from the suffering of their workers. Um, so I've already mentioned the Awesome Foundation as one example of a voluntary social spending tax. Other options are, are available through crowdsourced peer-to-peer -peer philanthropy websites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo and micro-lending sites like Kivo. But what I haven't seen yet is anything like what used to be called mutual aid societies. What we really need is a cooperative insurance system where in exchange for investment, members can receive access to improved legal, medical, and educational services. The state more or less took over all these services during the New Deal period in the wake of the Great Depression, and we're still allowing government to control them. But now that our governments have been taken over by neoliberal corporatism, those services are all being sold off to big business. What we need is an online economy that will help people restore the old system of 
grassroots and local mutual aid. And so far, I haven't seen anything that might do this. So this is the challenge I'm putting to the Bitcoin people. What is your plan for supporting your own friends and neighbors? As far as I can tell, Bitcoin is a fantastic opportunity for tax evasion. So if your plan is to bankrupt the state treasury, I want to know how you plan to replace it. What can your currency offer to us lefties who believe that profits should be spent on projects that improve the market for everyone, not just on luxuries for an elite group of hoarders? Controversial. Topic. So, take it away. <laughs> Anyone want to ask some questions? I'm warning now that I don't know the answers to any of your questions. <laughs> we can all answer it for you if you want. Who has some questions? Um, I guess, so you, the biggest issue you really have with Bitcoin, aside from just not knowing how we're going to create those social structures to actually get it back in the hands of people that actually probably really do need it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lack of regulation, more or less. It's, it's, yeah, well, my understanding is that it was kind of invented specifically to get away from regulation. Well, and that's the, the crypto part of cryptocurrency is that it's supposed to be so called frictionless, right? But the friction is there for a reason. It's supposed to keep people from abusing it. So what are we going to do instead? The, the, uh, Most Bitcoin miners and spenders want regulation. Because we're up in the air. We have no idea what we're supposed to be claiming and what we're not supposed to be claiming. Regulation actually helps us. Because as soon as there's regulation in place, businesses want to use it. Without regulation, they're at risk. Also, the crypto angle of it is also to prevent counterfeiting. Right. So primary. Uh, the, um, <laughs> Do you want to think for a second? Then I'll speak. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I, okay, yeah, so okay. Yeah, yeah. answer to your question. It's kind of, it's kind of, a, it's kind of dumb, but uh, Dogecoin, uh, a community built upon giving a cryptocurrency, exactly like Bitcoin, if you haven't heard about it, it's got a picture of a dog and there's billions of them, so they're worth pretty much nothing. And it's a whole cryptocurrency community based on giving them up to other people. Okay, so I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but it's a thing. Well, I'd, I'd <laughs> like to hear more about it before I know, but yeah. yeah as far as I can tell, what Dogecoin has that Bitcoin lacks is uh, really sticky built-in branding. Doge, <laughs> just look at it. It's funny. <laughs> Yeah, and I think you're kind of raising a, a really important point here because, you know, what I'm seeing with this exciting new movement is um, a lot of hype. And I've been in the activism business long enough to know that there's a big difference between, um, you know, hype-based social movements and, and real healthy social reform. So, you know, I worry that we're all just lemmings running off of a cliff here. And you know, just because this all sounds very, very liberal and revolutionary, it's going to free us from the evils of taxation and, and all of that stuff. And, and, and banker know, fees. And banker fees, well, which is, you know, sure, that's great. I hate big government. I hate it. I do not like, uh, you know, the state spying on me. I don't want my money going to police forces. I don't want it to be funding big military enterprises. I really don't like a bunch of Health Canada people telling me whether or not I can buy certain kinds of milk. Um, I like the freedom to make my own decisions about my own spending. I do, however, have a lot of concerns about the freedoms of really powerful people and especially really powerful groups to, you know, basically form cartels and, and uh, buy up enough market power to effectively make it impossible to compete with them. So, you know, I hear, I hear a lot of sort of libertarian free market talk that's actually just trying to justify centralizing power in the hands of a different group of people rather than the government. And so, you know, banks are regulated. There's all kinds of rules when people are doing you know, real estate trading, all that kind of stuff, that you have to be licensed for this kind of thing. Uh, if we're going to make things more frictionless, so-called, then, um, you know, why should I trust the new people who are handling this stuff? And, you know, I'll tell you, I've been trying to understand Bitcoin for like eight months, and it is completely opaque to me. I have to talk to people that I know that are, you know, experts in coding and hacking, and even they don't really get it. And they tell me, well, you know, it's sort of like this, but it's really complicated, and that's an area I don't really understand yet. And I'm like, so I'm supposed to rely on you to safeguard my, uh, 
you know, my wealth and my transactions. That just seems really uh, unwise. And so, you know, I would far rather trust a giant evil bank uh, because at least I know, right? It's like the devil you know versus the one you don't. At least I know what I'm up against when I'm dealing with those people. Is it fair to say that you don't own any Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> not yet. I mean, no, well, it's fair to say that I don't have Bitcoin. It's not fair to say that I won't, though, uh -huh. um, because um, I'm still open to the idea. I'm intrigued by it. I think it has a lot of potential. But I want to hear the answers to some of these risks first. Because, I mean, for me, um, the, there's obviously there's a risk to my own personal uh, bank account, which, of course, we hear on the news all the time. But I'm also concerned about the risk to the public treasury, and I'm not hearing anybody talking about that. I will talk about it in my presentation. Awesome. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. But first, we're going to take a very short uh, break and uh, let people get some refreshments. And we'll be back in about seven minutes. How about that? Refreshments. I have an informal question. Yeah, sure. We can talk. Who is Sas? I am Sas. Hi, I'm Doug Richardson. I offended you a couple of weeks ago. Oh, okay. You were on your travels around California. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was having a grand old time in San Diego. Oh, so you can, you can, yeah, you can pause. I'm